Hello, Blenders, and welcome. Welcome to episode number 167 of Real Blend, a podcast that learned it's really hard to stay quiet when your foot is in a bear trap. My name is Sean O'Connell, the managing editor of Cinema Blend, and this week on the show, the movies are back. Uh, at least two of the three, or three of the four, uh, Real Blend co-hosts have made it to the movie theaters this weekend. Jake, did you go? Did you go? You didn't go to the no, movies No, I, uh, I had other things to do. You had company. Yes. yes. You're a friend of the show uh, in Chicago. A friend Chicago. of the show. Chris Van Vliet uh, visited me in Chicago. We're going to review uh, The Conjuring Part 3, a.k.a. The Devil Made Me Do It. Uh, and Michael Chavez, who directed that film, uh, took over the baton from James Wan, is going to be this week's guest interview. Um, but of course, I have to introduce the co-hosts. Jake, since I started with you, let's keep going. Fox a 32 uh, in Chicago's own Jake Hamilton. Hi, buddy. Good to see you, my man. Good to it's see you it's as well too. strange, you know, one of the things that uh, Chris and I spoke about is the idea that you forget that you haven't seen someone because you talk to them so often. And uh, the, the, the four of us might potentially be in a room together in the coming weeks, would be a, which this, would be an incredible, uh, incredible thing. This is a uh, hashtag, if it happens, that has already taken more you than a You know we could all just turns. hang out. Like, it doesn't have to be for an if it happens. It could just no, be like, that's, y'all want to come to Chicago? That's not a possibility. Not Coming true. to see me is not... We no? only okay, get well, to do... Well, what was Van Vliet doing in Chicago? Was it a wrestling thing? No, Spielberg was in town. We interviewed him together. Oh, awesome. How'd that go? Yeah. Pretty good? Oh, no, you can listen to it. It'll be on this podcast. Awesome. On his wrestling podcast. <laughs> yeah. And you, Spielberg, Jake, weird. you're the one who reached out and booked that, right? You were like, can you do me this one yeah. huge favor, Spielberg? Nice. Yeah, and yeah, you, and you gave it to him. And, and so we went through his characters to see who would be the hardest to wrestle. Weirdly enough, E.T., his answer. Well, hmm. the finger. Interesting. And when, when Jake this, left this the interview. This show just went off the rails. When Jake left the interview, Spielberg <laughs> told Van Vliet, uh, that kid's got the stuff. Because he, he just says that about everybody. <laughs> Oh, wait, he said that to somebody else? <laughs> yeah, he says that to everybody. I'm, I'm out. <laughs> including uh, Kevin McCarthy of Fox 5 in Washington, D.C. Hi, Kev. Hi, it's Jonathan, Gabriel, Jacob. Good to see you guys. Ooh, I just all wanna, three of us got the full names. I want to point out today, I apologize to our YouTube viewers. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see this. My eye has a, a, an infection. So uh, if you want to zoom in at all today, and as you guys are watching our YouTube video, I have a nasty eyelid infection that I hope all of you enjoy. Thank I'm you for tuning in to our YouTube channel. Busy. I feel like this YouTube channel is either going to now like just, just like this video is going to skyrocket or it's going to get like three views. <laughs> I'm too distracted by your new hat. That's a new hat. I, for I, you. I also complimented his hat. I love that hat. Yeah, I got the hat at National Harbor uh, when I was at, uh, at work the other day and I like it too. It has like this like, I don't know, know what this is called, but it's it's a nice hat. I Very agree Very sharp. You guys. I like that color. I love that hat. Uh, so if you're looking at Kevin's hat on the YouTube channel, oh uh, while you're here, hit subscribe. And, and I honestly could not even notice until you said eye. it. Did you guys uh, notice? No, I didn't notice. Well, that looks like, someone, looks like I, someone knocks the, knocked the hell out of you. It, it honestly does. but it, 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 That's it, what it, I would tell people. You know what it's from? The the story is so not cool. It's from putting makeup on my on my face. And it not, and it, and it, like hey. the cool story would be someone punched me in the face yeah. because I told, because they didn't like Tenet or something like that. Yeah. And then the the other story would be, which is the real story, is I was putting makeup on hey, my dude, face. I do that. No, I have a question, Sean. Do you wear makeup whenever you do junkets? Um, I'll sometimes use uh, the the people who are provided. I don't bring yeah. my own. I used yeah, to right. put it on if I did like NBC here in the market, and then I just kind of stopped. Yeah. Um, and you don't need it because that's more, how handsome you are. You would you would think I know how to put makeup on. I've been doing it for since two thousand six or two thousand seven, yeah. and I still don't know how to do, do it. People I, ask I, me all the time. They're like, "What do you? What do you?" I'm like, "I don't know." Like it comes in one of these things, and I do this. Dude, is it the I max? Don't know. I don't it's know. the max pad. Is like it's a max uh, MACS, and it just <laughs> the, it's like a toner. It's all I, like, I, no, I get it from I, I get it from CVS. Anti shine. Yeah, I use. I use like these little sponges and the, the bad thing, the worst thing you can do with, uh, with a makeup sponge is reuse it, which I didn't know that. So the movies uh, are back what? this week, huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Damn it, game! We we're rolling there. Uh, yeah, we we're on a makeup. We we're on a makeup. The complete opposite spectrum from the our Kendrick Lamar rant that we went on last week. Just complete opposite end of the spectrum. Uh, have you signed up for Real Blend Premium yet? Because you can get even more conversations like this if you sign up for Real Blend Premium. <laughs> if you like what you just got, <laughs> yes, there's plenty more of that on Mondays waiting for you. Uh, get an ad-free version of the show. Get a newsletter from me every other week, and of course off the cuff conversations like this by going to um cinemablend.com backslash uh real blend premium gave sfx that in the show notes uh this week's weekly poll all right what did i ask i don't even remember 
Oh, okay. Um, for Quiet Place 2, that is opening. I asked the people uh, who follow along on social media, how much money will A Quiet Place 2 make this weekend? And then I specified, this is for the four-day total. Um, now, listen, you could have waited to vote, I suppose, uh, and looked at the numbers and then put it in. But, Kevin, the choices were, and I want you to tell me what you think the audience picked, um, okay. under 30 million, mm. 31 to 49 million, or more than 50 million. Our audience, well, it's interesting because uh, we, we actually did this on our show and we'll get into this when we get into the box office story about where we thought the money was going to be. Yes. Um, I'm going to assume, just, that, that this is a tricky question because I think at this point we already know what happened. But remember so the four the day, is, I put four day. So that's so important. Four day. That I'm going to go Monday. with the second option, the 31 to 49, 31 to 49 million. million. You are correct. And that is what they went with. Um, 52.2% went with the 31 to 49, 27% went more than 50 and quiet place ended up having a $57 million debut. Um, Jake, you lowballed them going into that, uh, into this poll. I did, but you know, I, I kind of want to talk about the box office after we do this interview. That's a good idea. Way to stay. <laughs> you know, I, why don't we just do the box office discussion after the interview? It's a really you know, great I mean? idea. That's a great idea. All Gabe, right, well, what do you then, think about that? Gabe, do you like that idea? I don't know. We could just hang out. <laughs> it's like, actually, I really want to talk about box office right now. Uh, solidifying the fact that the movies are back, we're coming off of A Quiet Place Part 2, and uh, we already have another big movie coming to theaters this week, and uh, also staying in the horror genre, but coming from Warner Brothers Pictures, it's Conjuring 3... The Devil Made Me Do It. And so we are thrilled to have the director of that film, Michael Chavez, joining us to talk about uh, all things Ed and Lorraine uh, and taking over for James Wan and how to make a good Conjuring film. And so without further ado, Michael Chavez talking about Conjuring 3, The Devil Made Me Do It. Uh, Michael, seriously, welcome to the Real Blend podcast. Um, I know you and I spoke uh, a couple of hours ago, but the, the cool thing about our, our podcast is that we really get to dive deep into sort of the more kind of technical, nerdy film stuff that a lot of times we don't get it to, to talk about uh, sort of with the, the TV interview. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start us off, um, and I want to talk about uh, one of your shots in the opening act of the film with the exorcist getting out of the car in front of the house. It's a beautiful shot, and I'm curious as a, as a filmmaker... You, you have to show that. It's, it's part of the plot. You have to show the exorcist getting out of the car in front of the house. But how do you frame it in such a way so that the audience doesn't go, oh, look, it's the exorcist shot? Because <laughs> the way that, that William Friedkin did it is so iconic. So how do you either pay tribute to it or veer away from that completely? I, you know, I think all the, without a doubt, there was, um, it was definitely put in there with intention and a nod towards that amazing film. And just a master filmmaker. So without, without a doubt, um, it was put there with a lot of love and a specific, you know, there's, you know, putting, putting a hat on father Gordon, giving him the exorcist case. There's a lot of different little choices that you can, you can make in that. And it was all done with, you know, a lot of love and a lot of intention to honor that film. I think that one of the things I love about the conjuring movies from the very first one is they are great examples of, of their genre. They stand on their own, but they're also love letters to the genre. And there's, you see so many nods to, to movies of the past. And I think that that's, I think that's awesome. I think it's awesome to be able to, you know, tip your hat to those movies, but then also to try and push it further to, you know, because I would, the moment that you do it, people are going to have an expectation of what that exorcism is going to look like. And it is the opportunity to go in another direction and do things that we haven't seen in the exorcist and we haven't seen in, in those films. So um, it was all intentional. I picked up a, a Kubrick uh, shining kind of reference too with Patrick Wilson. I won't talk about what, but was that deliberate also? <laughs> yes. Yes. No, absolutely. And you know, there was actually a lot of debate with that sequence and not to get into spoilers, but you know, what right. we, how far we could push it. It's interesting because, you know, the, uh, w without a doubt, I mean, this is a, this is a franchise that people love and these are characters that people love, uh, you know, at their, the core and, you know, everybody, the studio, myself, James would have conversations about, you know, we want to push the Warrens to the limit. We want to push the story to the limit. We want it to be filled with surprises, but we also need to take great care with what, we put them through and what they do because you know if you go too far then you can't ever walk that back you can't ever you know come back from it so there was 
Um, probably a great for a spoiler podcast discussion. About, yeah, sure. You know, I don't want to give that, that away. Navigated. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely don't want to give that away. That's a pretty key sequence. So um, I do want to get back to your exorcism scene in the very beginning, though, Michael, because um, it, once I saw uh, uh, something that was included in the scene, it, it reminded me immediately again that you give the date, but I think I wasn't just paying attention. And I saw somebody actually videotaping the exorcism, you know, and then you you sort of cut and show the footage of the exorcism. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it's the 80s. That would make sense. You know, that someone would be videotaping it, which led me to immediately wonder, like, in preparation for this, did you get to watch video footage of exorcisms? You know, there wasn't any video footage. There was Polaroids, which we couldn't use because of legal reasons. And then okay. there was, but there was audio recordings. And we feature really one exorcism in the film. This, as you've seen it, it goes ter- horribly wrong. That was, there was actually multiple exorcisms. This was something that lasted for, for months. They actually, there was a total of, I think, six priests which came in at oh, different wow. times, sometimes two at a time. It was, uh, so there's, there's many accounts of it. There was the audio recordings, which, you know, we play at the end of the movie and that was definitely a source of inspiration. And, you know, I played that for members of the team and some of the actors. And it was something where it, that, you know, it's, it's funny. It's, it's a, it's a recording that gets under your skin. You know, I, I played it at first just to kind of get people shamelessly in the mood, but it, it really affects people when you hear it. And I think that the, you know, I, with all these stories, it's always that kind of fun game of what do I believe? Maybe I believe in ghosts. Maybe I believe in demons, maybe not. And you can kind of pick and choose. And with this, once you start getting into the realities of the case and, you know, beyond just this exorcism of this young boy into the murder trial, you know, what you choose to believe isn't just like a game anymore. It really starts to have weight. And when you're, you're making these claims of, I choose to believe him, I choose not to believe him. You know, all of a sudden it's, you know, we're talking about real lives and a real victim. And, you know, it, it really, I think is a, it's kind of a different animal. Yeah, you know, you're absolutely right about how unnerving uh, that the audio is at uh, over the credits, and and really, it's it, even even after the lights went up and the audio was over, I kind of just sat in my theater for a second. Um, I want to talk about. I'd imagine there's a lot more audio than you just didn't have room for, and I was really fascinated in in sort of going in sort of my deep rabbit hole research on this case that the whole plot line of Arnie inviting the demon into is was a thing that he actually did, and I was sort of curious was that caught on on the audio recording could you hear uh, arnie doing that in real life you know strangely there was a lot of recordings we we never heard that mm-hmm. um but it was something that the that you know there's multiple witnesses who um uh you know who saw that the warren saw that and you know debbie saw saw that and it was something that he was there's even audio recordings that i don't think it i you know we might have a clip of it over those end credits but the the idea that that Arnie was always challenging this demon, you know, trying to protect protect David. They, you know, they had a kind of a big brother, little brother relationship. You know, he was he was dating uh, Debbie at the time, and so when this started happening with with David, this was after they had already been dating, and he had basically struck up this friendship, you know, with the family, and then also with the boy, and he would take them them all out fishing, and so they almost became their little, a little unit. And so when this started happening with David, uh, I, I think it had a big impact on Arnie and, you know, he really, you know, I can only imagine what he was going through and what the whole family was going through, you know, during that time. Your actors really sell that relationship. You know, you only get a few minutes to establish it. And I think it does a really great job of setting up that relationship, that bond between those characters. So, so that when, when it transitions, it, you know, it was totally believable. Um, Up to this point, Michael, now this is, you know, chapter seven, I believe, of the Conjuring franchise at this point now, uh, there are some rules in play. You know, there are things in place that we've come to expect as the audience. And uh, in particular, supporting characters that have the potential to spin off, whether it be the nun or a slender man or, of course, Annabelle. uh, Have there been conversations? Do you think about like, oh, I'm introducing some pretty wild threats uh, they could go in, in many different directions as we explore them. Yeah, you know, I, there's there's always those conversations. Um, 
I think one of the things that I would compliment New Line and James about is ultimately, you know, those are always the fun conversations to have. And I think we all would love to, you know, spin, spin things off indefinitely. Ultimately, <laughs> They just want to make the best movie possible. And, you know, going through this, you know, this making this movie, it, it became very clear, you know, because I think the assumption going in is that, you know, we're just we're, we're grabbing every single monster and we're, we're trying to find a, a spinoff for it. But what was great is that, you know, this is, you know, New Line is filled with horror fans. You know, the, the executives there aren't just like random movie executives. They love they love movies. They love horror movies. And the same thing with James and all of us grew up loving new line horror movies. And so we, you know, we come into this with a great love of the genre. And, you know, this was definitely something that from the very beginning, James and new line and myself wanted to, to deliver a different conjuring movie, a movie that, that would surprise people and would take the Warrens into a new direction. And, you know, with that came, some growing pains. We had a demonic character in this in this film, which we ended up cutting out. And it was it was the type of character that could have easily was people really enjoyed him. But it was getting a little too complicated. The movie ultimately it's a mystery. It needs to resolve. It needs to kind of have, you know, it needs to kind of filter down to a resolution. And he was the type of character that I think, you know, who knows, maybe he'll make his way into another um, Conjuring film. But it was the type of thing that if they were, everyone was ruthlessly, you know, committed to spinning off uh, movies, we would have probably just kept him in. But at every stage, it's, you know, everyone wanted to make just the best movie possible. And so sometimes that means killing your babies or exercising your demons. And and we did that <laughs> for uh, for this one. But um but yeah, that, that was probably a much more longer, complicated answer. But, but uh, you know, and honestly, once the movie comes out, I would love to like share behind the scenes footage of this guy because I think that it was, it was a big bold swing, and it was one of those things. You know, it was a, it was a demon I got to create with James. It was a real, just such an. I mean, James, the master monster maker, and that was a real thrill. And you know, it, it is sometimes it's hard to to kill your babies. That's awesome. I want to see that so badly. <laughs> Um, Michael, I was, I told you, I went on a deep dive, uh, with the Arnie Johnson trial, uh, and just, I was, cause I was just fascinated with, with that story. And I know, uh, you know, there's a huge part of this film that kind of veers off where it's not necessarily about the trial anymore, but I'm just sort of curious, like that's it. Cause it would be a completely different film. I'm just sort of curious, is, is there a different film to be made about the trial per se? Cause I'm genuinely fascinated with the whole legal concept of using because I, I didn't realize that it was it was named the devil made me do it trial i'm curious is that is that sort of a, a different film to be made about sort of the the legal aspects of trying to use religion as a defense yeah you know it's funny because the and i think it's you know there's there's i think some people have seen the movie and wanted more trial and maybe less scares or less <laughs> you know i don't know what uh, we would have exchanged for it um but the, you know, the trial is in the backdrop and definitely there are, you know, some scenes where we're in the courtroom, but ultimately we wanted to follow the Warrens on their journey as they're investigating it. I do think that the trial itself was pretty fascinating. There's so many details of it that you probably could make a mini series of it. You probably could almost do like the night of, I don't know if you guys ever saw that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You know, where it's, you really kind of dig into the abnormalities of this case. As I was, I think I told you before with the, there were six priests who came in to the, over the course of uh, these two, three months, six priests came through that house and some of them were actually came from Rome. They were trained in Rome. This was a full on, uh, Catholic Church approved exorcism of those six priests, not one of them w- were available to come to the the trial. They basically the the Catholic Church either moved them one guy back to Ireland, uh, which ironically Rory comes from, and uh, <laughs> you know none of them basically they were all silenced. And you could almost look at that and just wonder, well, why? I mean, if they're just going to test testify to their experience, why would they? Why would the church be opposed to them? testifying and it you could almost spin that out into 
something conspiratorial was happening there, which I'm not saying it was, but it just seems strange. There were so many things like that. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the whole case is, is fascinating. Uh, so many horror franchises are driven by the threat, you know, whether it's Jason or Freddy or, or something that's propelling it forward. The Conjuring I love is because it's propelled by by Vera and Patrick, you know, and literally I want them to make a dozen more of these because I just love the two of them together. Tell me about how much ownership they have over the Warrens. Um, and when you come into it, you know, you're the first time directing in, in this franchise. They've been in it for the third time. How much do they come to you and talk about, like, here's what we want to accomplish this time out with them? Or, you know, if you suggest something and they're like, no, they wouldn't do that because we're, we're totally familiar with how the characters go. Yeah, you know, honestly, coming into it, I, I had that same question. I was I was thinking, first of all, thrilled I'm making a Conjuring movie. Uh, yeah. But the, my my first thought is, you know, are they even going to listen to me? And, you know, they're, they're the Warrens. They already have the Warrens. They're not even going to be open to anything. But what makes it how awesomely collaborative they were. And they, you know, they're, they're there. 100 percent they've they've defined these characters and they really really they really know them and not just the people that they're portraying but also this the cinematic version of the warrens which i think that has also evolved as it's you know as we're on the third movie the in terms of patrick and vera they're they're really awesome it's funny because they you know they both work very differently you know vera is very instinctive you know she's very almost like Lorraine herself where she she just has she's driven by her gut and you know she just wants to jump into it she just is feeling it and just wants to go and she doesn't almost you know sometimes she wouldn't even rehearse I mean she'll rehearse for the other actors but you know normally she wouldn't rehearse and then Patrick's the total opposite and almost very much like Ed where he's very verbal and articulate and he'll talk things out and to, to the point of would they be open to to direction and all, all that, um, the first couple of days, you know, we'd start a scene and I'd lay it out for them. And then Patrick would come to me with all these questions, questions and he'd say, you know, are we going to be doing this or what about this? Or, you know, should I really be coming in through here? And he'd go through this list. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I got this all wrong. Patrick is he's, he, he's you know, he's got all these questions. I must be doing something wrong. But then I realized that that's Patrick's process that almost like like a pilot kind of goes through his checklist before every scene. He just, he really wants to talk it out. He really wants to, to kick the tires on stuff. And I was actually so amazed because, you know, I'd pitch him, you know, you know what I'm thinking for the scene and how, how it's going to play. And then it, but after we kind of go through this big kind of, you know, talking it out, it would always just come back to, you know, he's always embraced the idea, always went with it. And I, I just love that. I mean, I, I think that it, it's also, I think, a testament to their confidence as actors that they that they know their characters that they are unflappable that it, you know i can come in with my crazy ideas and you know we'll be able to work it out and make an awesome movie james wan could have given you a heads up about how they approach material <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to surprise me <laughs> I mean, no, honestly the experience working with those guys has been the greatest thrill they are such awesome people and you know they also have got this great chemistry and this great friendship and you know, it was like it was like summer camp. Every time you know I would come to set, set, you know, they just they loved hanging out with each other, and that kind of just infected everybody. Everyone was just you know, it was it was a really great experience. That's awesome. Um, I know we lost uh, Lorraine Warren in 2019, but I'm curious as to uh, at what point in the process you were on this film, and that like, did you have her to be able to to ask questions? Were you able to to glean any information uh, from her before she passed, or or was uh, she not in a place where she was able to really contribute with the film. Yeah, no, she, you know, when I when I got the uh, the job, she was still alive, and I was really excited to meet her. And um, we were planning it, and then she got sicker, and it was delayed, and then she passed. So I wasn't able to, uh, I wasn't able to meet her, and that was honestly just, I mean, that was a real, you know. Uh, it was, it was a bummer. It was a real disappointment. Um, I, I can say, I feel like I've gotten to know her through Vera and I'm, I'm not even joking there. She, you know, Vera from the beginning, she approached the conjuring 
did I say this in our other interview? No, no. The um, you know basically she went into the the first Conjuring and she was she wanted to approach it like a biopic. She wanted to 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 basically down to the clothes, down to the way she talks. And of course, you see that you see the the that she is Lorraine Warren. And it was funny because now we all accept that we we wouldn't accept anything else. But when she was first doing that, you know, in the first movie, I think there was a lot of concern between you know behind the scenes and with the producers about how bold that look was and and Vera stood her ground and I think that you know Vera's been committed in portraying Lorraine as as true to to life as possible and the story she would tell me about Lorraine if sometimes it felt like and maybe it was because she would kind of revert to the the Lorraine her kind of uh, her dialect and her uh, her way of speaking it felt like I was hanging out with Lorraine Warren and, you know, that was honest. That was the closest that I, I got to her. And, um, but also just a real Testament to, to Vera's commitment to the role. All right. We're running out of time. I want to get you out of here on this one, Michael. Um, and I won't give any context for the scene, uh, but there's a, a scene that involves Vera and rats. And uh, that truthfully, there's nothing more terrifying to me than rats. Uh, the minute I see them, I'm, I'm wormed out. Uh, so I need to know, uh, was Vera actually interacting with rats? And if you come into a sequence like this, do you have to approach the actress and say, like, are you OK with this? Because if, if that were written into a scene for me, I would just be like, I'm sorry, get someone else. So um, that is so funny. Yeah, that rats freak me out, too. So originally it was going to be snakes. OK, <laughs> so I can do really snakes. snakes. I'd be OK with. I can do snakes. Yeah. I'm yeah. all right with that. You know, it's the funny thing is Vera was also cool with it. And when she got the script, she sent me back. She has a pet snake. You know, her kids have this pet snake. And she sent me back this picture with with her and this this snake. And it was like she's kind of nuzzled up with it. And um, and then, you know, we kept on developing it. And, um, you know, snakes weren't really working for a couple of reasons. Also, there's snakes in the nun. And I felt like the nun kind of own snakes and I wanted to do something different. <laughs> so um, so I changed it to rats and then I sent that back to, to Vera and Vera said, we're, we're not doing snakes. <laughs> what do you mean rats? <laughs> and we, what I can say is we definitely had, we had Vera on that set, we had rats on that set. We did not have the two together. I, uh, I didn't want to put- um, Movie magic. You know, I wanted to, you know, I, I got to take take care of uh, Vera Farmiga. I'm not going to throw her into the, a, a tight space <laughs> with a bunch of rats. Good, I instantly feel better. I feel better. Yeah. <laughs> well, Michael, thank you so much for joining Real Blend. Uh, we, we enjoyed having you on and continued success uh, with this franchise and everything else you do. Yeah, thanks. So, so great to talk to you guys. And, and Michael, I told Sean about our plan of like having a picture of us in the artifact room. So people look at these two guys and they're like, what, what, what is the story behind that picture? And it's going to be just us like, <laughs> like just the most goofy picture imaginable. I love it. Well, it'll have to be black and white, so it looks kind of yes. creepy and vintage, but I love Done. the thumbs up. It's like, Done. why are they giving a thumbs up? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and they, whatever story people come up with will, will be infinitely better. Cool, dude. Thanks so much. Thanks for being a great guy. Thanks. Hey, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much to Warner Brothers for giving us time with Michael Chavez, and thank you, Michael, for coming on the show. Uh, make sure you guys check out Conjuring as it's coming to theaters and also available on HBO Max in their day and date uh, situation, and we will have a review of new conjuring film later on in the show so let's get to talking points you know we mentioned the box office uh and the fact that in its this felt like the first official week of movies being back i know we've had a couple of random one-offs that made it to theaters uh, mortal Kombat, godzilla vs kong a couple of smaller films that did go through a theatrical run but this felt like the weekend where people who had been waiting to return to multiplexes used quiet place as their opportunity to go. I saw a lot of people on social media posting pictures of themselves in theaters. Um, I shared a picture from our quiet place uh, tickets. Uh, Kevin, I know you went uh, opening night on Thursday box office. First week quiet place. Part two does 57 uh, million dollars domestically, $79 million worldwide. Uh, before we get to that. Well, no, let's touch on that first before we get to the next one. Jake, you had it about 20 million, I believe. So, uh, yeah. what wh what happened? I just, you know, what's so interesting is I just felt like I wasn't hearing people talk about that movie. Mm. Like, I know that we were excited about it, and I just felt like, you know, people who I work with and friends, like, I just felt like I wasn't hearing anyone 
say anything about it. As opposed to like, I, I was, I felt like I was here. Everyone was asking me about Cruella, and a lot of people were asking, "Have you seen Cruella? What, is Cruella any good?" Um, and you know, so I really thought Cruella was gonna come out. I kind of felt like, uh, you know, Quiet Place doesn't it, it doesn't have the uh, the momentum that it did the first time. I trust me, I'm incredibly happy to be wrong because mm-hmm. I love that movie and I love that it did so well. Um, and I love I mean, it's and really both movies did. You know, Cruella did not open poorly; it did pretty well as well. Um, I, so yeah, I, 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 it's, I'm very perfectly happy being wrong, but I just felt like I wasn't hearing, I mean, did you guys like, were you hearing about it? Were you having people ask you about it? I think this was like a perfect intersection of where we are in terms of the, of the country right now. And this movie coming out, it was like this weird, like it, 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 I, I don't know if it had something to do. I mean, I think again, the first movie had so much, uh, positive buzz to it that I think it already had a built-in audience. The first movie did like 50 million opening weekend. I, th- I feel like at that point last weekend when that movie came out, I'll tell you why I think this, like when I got out of the elevator from the parking garage to walk down to the movie theater on Thursday for a five o'clock showing, uh, which is cool by the way, they're doing five o'clock showing now. And, and remember they used to do seven, it used to be like midnight. Mm-hmm. Now it's sevens. Now it's fives, which is awesome. Five is incredible for morning show people. So thank you very much for that. Um, but as I was walking to the theater, it was as if it was as if our world or our, our country or the area I was living in had returned to some quote unquote normalcy. Like everybody was outside. There was a live band playing um, there. It was, the weather was incredible. Um, and, there was just something about that walk that to the theater that felt just normal again. And I don't know what normal was going to be going forward. And I know there's other countries in the world and other parts of the world that are not normal yet. I mean, there's a lot of things happening. And I do want to mention that because the United States is one thing and there are people still suffering here and also across the world. Um, but in terms of our country, it just felt big. It felt like a, I mean, everybody was outside. It was unreal. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I just felt, I felt a vibe and I think it was just like, okay, everyone's been inside the whole time. Even though you're going inside to go to a movie theater, it was like going to the movie was all, was, was the event. It wasn't really even going to the movie, the, uh, the actual movie itself. It was like getting out of your house, going to a theater and sitting in the theater to see it. Now, we can get to Cruella, which is interesting because I feel like that was hit, hurt a little bit by the Disney plus premiere access uh, angle because that was a $30 charge and you know families could have watched it there I don't know how much money they made on that end that's gonna be another discussion leading into the future is how we blend those box offices together um, but I mean Quiet Place I feel like just hit at the right time it was the right time for the movie it already everybody who loved the first one the movie made over 300 and something million the first time around on a 17 million dollar budget you already had that excitement built in the projections for the first weekend when it was supposed to come out in March of 2020, was like 60 million, I believe. Which is so just already, about what it opened to, right. which is crazy. Kind of, well, the, to Jake's point about why he came in lower on predictions, not all theaters are even open yet. Not mm-hmm. even, not not everybody's even operating at full capacity. So, like the fact that this movie did what it did. <laughs> you know, is absurd. Like, I mean, like, I don't think anybody, I don't know anybody that I know predicted that high. That was in a, a 19 million or so on Friday was that seeing that number felt like it was like a normal movie weekend. It was very big. Also, um, that movie I, ran I a marketing, it, people. Yeah. it ran a marketing campaign back in March of 2020. Yeah. And then it had That's to true, rerun too. a marketing campaign and re-remind but they didn't people. Have to, did know. they read, did they read, but to Jake's point, did they really redo it as Big? No, they Jake, didn't. Do you, I didn't feel. I didn't it's, feel it, it felt as more, big. Uh, grassroots. It felt. I mean, I, I'm sure you guys saw like Taren, or, no, uh, Krasinski, Krasinski going um, around, going, uh, to theaters. going to different theaters, and you know, kind of. So it kind of felt more, and it definitely felt more. And I, I think we're going to almost get to the point of getting tired of this. Is pushing the movies are back uh, angle. And yeah, I, I know you're fast, already tired of it. It's been well, a week. no, but like I know, like fat. That's gonna be like the whole Fast Nine campaign. Oh, and by yeah. like, I swear to God, if Dune comes out and going like movies are back, I'm mean, like Jesus Christ. Like yes, I know movies are back. Yes, <laughs> we know. Back. I yeah, they did think that. Quiet Place had that had that perfect. What well, do you guys remember that question I asked in the show last week, which was like, do you think people are gonna be weird about going to a movie that deals with like a post apocalyptic element where people and I, I, I obviously that didn't factor into anybody's decisions because everyone went and saw it, but I just wonder like was it the perfect event film? It was PG thirteen. Mm-hmm. It's a nice ninety minute lean mm-hmm. horror film that 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 has two well, big stars. Also everyone got great reviews. Off. Very yeah, solid great reviews. reviews. It was just like. 
I don't know why. I, I, I think of things like this sometimes. I know, I know you do too, Sean, in terms of like the way things work out and like, like the coincidences you fall into. It, it, I mean, I saw a tweet. Someone tweeted something like, um, did, did Jim from The Office save movies? Yeah, I and saw that. Just... It was like, like, like we all thought it was going to be Nolan. Then some of us thought it was going to be Godzilla and King Kong. But who would have thought Jim from The Office was going to be right. the one to save yeah. movies? Well, Kev, I think it you was hit like this the nail on the head timing. that it not having the digital or the, the streaming option yeah. was yeah. huge. Because I bet a, a, a pretty large portion of the people who did go out to the theaters to go see it would have been content to watch it at home. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so that yeah. gets us to Cruella. Because Cruella did 26.5 million domestically against 57 that the four million. four day? That's the four day, yes. Um, okay. As opposed to the 57 that uh, Quiet Place did. Cruella did 42.6 million worldwide. Now, we don't know, as Kevin pointed out, how much it made in the premiere. But to give you just a... Um, and I texted you guys on Saturday morning um asking if you had yeah, access to yeah, your screeners yeah, you cheap ass because <laughs> i had a screener of it in my digital screenings thing and it was active Expire. until june whatever well, it was active active till june something and this is really inside baseball but i'm running into a problem with that screening service in that it plays the audio for me on certain stuff but i don't get the video um, I couldn't watch The Bad Batch on Disney's uh, screening service because I only got the audio. And I felt bad because Saturday was Michelle's birthday. And she was like, all I want to do Saturday morning after we get up and have breakfast is sit down like a family and watch a movie. We don't get to watch oh. one anymore. And so she was like, can we watch Cruella? And I was like, yes, I have oh. a screener of it. Let's sit down. So we sat down, tried to pull up the screening link, and uh, it did not work. It only ran the audio and didn't run the picture. So I just I said, really well, wish that's you okay. loved your wife more. I said, you really... Well, listen, no. I said, listen, you really want to watch this. Um, let's just rent it. It's 30 bucks on Disney Premium. And she was like, hell no, I'm not spending $30 <laughs> for Cruella. So I think that that price point is still a little high pretty, for people. Well, because like... because people, But people aren't rationalizing it as... There would have been four of you in that room. Sure. It would have been more expensive for the four of you to go see it in theaters. Yes. Than it would have been to sit down. But I have a question for you. When you guys, because I haven't, I haven't paid for anything on Disney Plus aside from the, the monthly subscription. It, it's yours. It, Once it stays. you keep it, it stays. Oh, interesting. It's, okay. it's not, it's not like a 48 hour rental thing. Correct. Yeah. Well, so you're, you're buying it. You're buying it. Mulan stayed. I don't know if they changed it because I was actually thinking about this the other day. Because is it Black Widow is or is not doing the Disney premiere it access? It is. It is. Okay. I wonder if they're going to change that because theoretically speaking, yeah. I mean, like I, I, I would imagine you you want to be like, listen, you pay for it and then it's gone in forty eight hours if you're the studio. Yeah. But I mean, it's great for the it's great for the consumer to be able to keep it, no question. Um, I have a, uh, something about Cruella that I find interesting. I think Cruella had a hard time finding a, a, a huge audience because I don't think parents truly knew what the movie was. Mm -hmm. It's a really dark movie. It's not a kid's movie. I was on the I was on the air in Philly. I do reviews for Fox Philly every Friday. And this anchor was asking me, you know, can I take my kids to see this? And I'm like, ah. I was like, I don't know. I That's mean, always how such old are a weird kids? question, too. I hate that question because well, it's like, what do you? It's, I don't know what you show your kids. I don't know like how well, mature your kids are. I, I think the reason why it was an interesting question is like, like if she said, "Can I take my kids to see um, Toy Story 3? Well, those are the sure. obvious ones, sure. right? Yeah. But like Cruella, I felt like Cruella was in this weird bubble where I don't think it knew. It, I don't think it knew what it was because it's a, it's a it's a wild movie. Every song in the film is for like the adult audience no question there's doors there's bgs there's you know florence and the machine someone and I counted just there's 33 needle drops in the film wow Too many. <laughs> Too many we, could, we could just do a uh a, a, a cuella needle drop blend just yeah. from that movie <laughs> yeah i like that film a lot but there's too many needle drops like they, they, they utilize the music to tell the story too much but that being said everyone knew what they were getting with quiet place right you knew exactly what you were getting when you sat down yeah. pg-13 horror film you already saw how crazy it got the first time around so you, cruella i don't know the that the marketing they marketed it so much like joker that i that i wonder if parents were turned off by it a little bit it's a super dark i mean it wasn't i don't know i don't know sean or sean you saw it no you didn't you know sean you well, did see i did it. see it i saw it in the theater you went to a screening yes right i, I mean it's a hard sell to parents that movie it's a um, it's a kind of a it's for sure. So, but also, is it possible 13. that Cruella just 
you know, Brendan's 13 different. and he would have been fine. You know, I wasn't concerned That's about fine. anything in it. I was more interested in it holding his attention because it's long. You know, someone, uh, Kelly uh, Bamberg, yeah. who uh, want, listens to our show and works at Cinema Blend, this morning described it to me as like the extended cut of a movie. And she was like, I didn't yeah. really want to see the extended cut. I wanted to see like a trimmed down version of it because it just feels like certain songs are too, certain scenes are too long and certain things yes. just, just sort of, you know, uh, drift away. And, and it's not it's as basically focused 30 as music it should videos. be. It does yeah. feel that way. Yes. But here's what I want to ask. Yeah. If Cruella did 26.5 million, two, two things. One, is that a victory for Cruella? Is that a strong opening for it? And two, if yeah. the, if the Disney premiere access cut into Cruella's box office potential, does that mean like Black Widow might only open to like 30 or 40 because people can watch it at home? Kevin Feige See, would not like that. That's an interesting thing. I, if I'm Disney, and I don't know how this legally plays out. I know Gabe has the point to make as well. Um, if I'm Disney and I see the box office this weekend for Quiet Place, I mm. pull Black Widow from Premier Plus, Premier Access, okay. and you just tell the consumers, "Listen, we're in a different spot now. Movies you are know, back. Movies are back." <laughs> I don't know if you heard. Like, I don't know if you heard. Well, and they, they're back. And they just said a 45 day window, so it's not even that long if they mm, do right. the 45 day window. Through Disney, I I can't. I, I again, I don't know the legality of this. I don't know what the premier access thing signed up for because if they've already been marketing it that way, I don't think you can. I don't know if we can reverse it. It's the same question we had about HBO Max. Like you know, in my opinion, based on the box office numbers that came out for Quiet Place, In the Heights should just be opening up in theaters. Yeah, it should not Heights. even go to HBO Max. Let me look. Yeah. Um, be, and so, but again, Suicide this all goes too. back. And this also goes back to a very important point, though, people. Or is everybody really feeling safe to go back to the movies yet? And and again, that's where we're at now. We all feel a certain way about it. You know, I felt safe seeing Tenet even during like the the big parts of the pandemic. But I also there's a lot of questions about whether or not it's still safe. So 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 a couple of things. One, I checked on the app because I was curious. I think there's a window before it comes out where they were letting you like pre-order the Premier Access stuff. So it would they have not started the pre-order on Black Widow yet. So technically, that would if they did, I would have said okay, they're not going to back track on that because people have already made the purchase so i would say it's still up in the air um but before we moved on i wanted to ask jake you didn't get to rewatch quiet place right correct uh last week we all kind of were discussing it. it had been a year since you had seen it now that you guys kind of got a refresh before we move on do you want to give quick um yeah, oh, refresh thoughts on it i do which i think people uh, are looking uh, forward uh, to. <laughs> go for it i know i seriously I, I liked it better the second time um i actually think i might like the second one better than the first one wow um, and that's coming from just, uh, you know what Quiet Place 2 reminded me of, Sean? I don't know, uh, in terms of editing and just relentlessness is Infinity War. Okay. Um, just in terms of it, just the way it moves and and and, and it just hits beats. Um, I still have some issues. You know, I, 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 I won't give any spoilers away, but you guys remember in the first one, my, my big problem was the nail. Mm. This time around, my big problem was the uh, oxygen tank uh, mm. lowering. My only issue with those, and I'll just give this, I'll give this brief and vague. In the first Quiet Place, there's a scene where we are shown a nail, and obviously the character is going to step on it. My problem with that scene was that he has to zoom into it, and it becomes like a "Hey, don't forget this" kind of thing. I think it could just been a wider shot, keep it like vague, have the audience maybe notice it, maybe not notice it. That becomes the intensity. But I get so it. So when this is this isn't one, it the towel? Wouldn't it be the towel on the door? Tal didn't bother me. It, okay. He probably zooms in to the oxygen lowering three or four times. Okay. Like he tell, he reminds us so many times. But again, this is such a nitpicky thing. The movie's still great. I'm being very persnickety about this. But I just find sometimes when you're watching a film, if you can feel the director telling you, like I felt like John Krasinski was like, Kevin, look at, look at, look at the oxygen tank. <laughs> like I, I was like, I just don't need if that. I, but... I swear to God, if I ever make a movie, there's going to be like an audio commentary. Just like, Kevin. <laughs> okay. um, you know who you know you know what the second viewing did for me that the first viewing didn't necessarily click was killian murphy's performance mm. um I, I think i i just think he's such an understated brilliant actor and i say understated because i just don't think that he's not showy yeah but like his face like there's a shot in the movie i think we actually i don't know if i mentioned this to krasinski in our interview where we're just looking at Killian from the side and it's like this like his face is lit up perfectly and you can see the film grain like swimming around his face and it's like 
I, I just like his face was made for film. Like that that face is so expressive and so. Have you have you watched know, Peaky I, Blinders at all? I've never seen Peaky Dude, Blinders. Oh, I've never so watch Peaky Blinders. I, I know. I just like <laughs> rewatched a bunch of it and am catching up on the fifth season right now. He oh. is. An amazing actor. Gabe, when you yeah. hear the song Red Right Hand. Oh, dude, you think I'm in of, a groove. Okay, but do you, what, what, what do you think of? Do you think of Peaky Blinders, Scream, or Dumb and Dumber? Uh, Peaky, Peaky Blinders now, yeah. Right yeah, now, I think definitely. of Scream. Scream. But I know, but it, which is strange because Peaky Blinders, because the, so Kevin, the, the, the credits to Peaky Blinders is Red Right Hand. Okay. That, but that's I also, a great song. But I also think of Dumb and Dumber where he's like, got the, where he like <laughs> goes and buys yeah. the giant cowboy hat and he's like giving <laughs> yeah. like the, the magazine. He's like, hey, little old lady. I'm curious. <clears throat> but I, I got to watch it, uh, obviously. And I'm curious. I had some small nitpicky stuff. I think it's a brilliant film. And I hope. So good. I hope that its success kind of brings a new wave of this kind of movie um, mm -hmm. where people aren't like, let's spend half a billion dollars on a three hour movie. Maybe let's spend. Yep. Thirty million dollars on a really great yeah. ninety-minute movie, and that Lean can and, and that can make you. I a shit felt ton like of we saw song. a lot of thirty-minute or not thirty-minute, a lot of ninety-minute movies last year. Because remember, like pressing play and seeing the runtime whenever we were all stuck at home, thinking, "Ooh, like ninety minutes." That's well, those nice. were the movies that and got like, thrown into the gauntlet. Yeah, and thrown into. And so this year, I feel like all the movies that I'm uh, we're like going to see. I'm like, God, it's like two yeah. fifteen. So, Good God! But that's a style of film. Like he he's doing a very classic style of filming. A very nice. Um, the sort of I don't know how long Jaws is, but the sort of like Jaws classic blockbuster. Yeah. Uh, 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 just the movie itself is just exciting. We don't need this long thirty-minute denouement where we're going to find out what happens. It's just right. We resolved it. Let's move on. Um, I'm curious to see like the deleted scenes because there are my small nitpicks have to do with some small lines and moments that like are delivered with a sort of like they're supposed to be more of a punch. But we don't yeah. really have enough context of like why are they this passionate right now? And the performances are all great, so I don't think it's like someone was miss uh, missed the performance and then Krasinski then missed it in the edit. I don't think it's that simple. I think to me it feels like there were some scenes that maybe got cut out um, that would have gave some more. Oh, again, small nitpick stuff that I'm curious to see how it. Unfolds. I will say that a... um, Michelle and PJ came with me last night. Uh, we saw it went uh, Monday night, and the two of them were exhausted by the end of it from the amount of tension like michelle was a, a a ball of nerves to the point where even when we were home she just sat down at the kitchen island and was just like i gotta just stop for a minute. <laughs> like she was still on nerve also i mean she's a mom so probably that that movie hits her it's differently a huge component to that and um yeah and pj felt like it was um he, he thought it was better than the first one so uh, it was fun. There were a bunch of times where I turned to kind of watch their reactions because I remembered stuff that was coming up. Um, I think Millicent Simmons is the MVP of the yeah. movie. She is She's fantastic. phenomenally good. Um, but what Krasinski does that I found to be extremely effective is how often he drops out all the sound so you feel like her. And there's a moment when she wakes up um, and is searching around for her um, her earpiece and can't find it and is terrified uh, and I was terrified for her because at that moment, like, you know, she can't hear anything. We can't hear anything as the audience. And it really made me feel um, her fear, you know, and, and the fear that comes with that. So, so many smart decisions that, yeah, I think there are a couple of nitpicks as well, too. But I think the things that he gets right, like the day one sequence yeah. is phenomenal. Uh, it's Best such a great way movie. to introduce yeah. all of that stuff. And uh, yeah, it's great. It's just. Really, I went really back great. and re-listened to our uh, Krasinski interview finally, and uh, I there are so many points that he made that I completely forgot. The, the birds thing I thought was fascinating. The idea that like birds are fine and they're probably going to overtake the world because like the the monsters can't get them and the yeah. poor dogs are gone. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. My, 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 <laughs> yes. My, 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 my I <laughs> one little two little nitpicky things I wanted to bring up that I'm interested to see if you guys bothered you guys as well. I think Jaiman Hansu. Um, I don't think that that to me he's too famous to show up for that moment. That was one thing that felt like there was maybe a, some deleted moments some from more his stuff introduction. With him. Yeah, because <clears throat> yeah, he, he's, the he's in the other, movie pretty quick. Yeah, yeah, and his I don't want to give anything away. I just thought like some of his dialogue, like you said, it seemed a little strange. The other thing I had the little nitpicky thing: movies do this all the time. This is not just Quiet Place. But you know when you have like two or three elements of action that are happening in different places all being edited together to, mm -hmm. to make an intense scene? You normally use that in the third act of a film. There, there were one or two instances in this film where I thought continuity wise it threw me off. Because when you, and this is such a nitpicky thing, but when you cut to another scene 
and then you cut back to the other scene, the other scene should still be in motion. Do you so know what I mean? It should have been. It should have progressed further. Correct. So when they cut back to the earlier scene and they're still in the same position and haven't done something yet, that that took me out. See, I don't know if you know what I'm referring yeah, to. Just the doc scene. I don't think he was trying to. I think it was a different approach to it. He wasn't trying to mm. um, show them playing out necessarily like in real time. He was definitely deliberately mirroring those scenes, like especially in the third act when he's cutting back and forth. He puts like, Which I like love. one character oh is God, positioned, you know, next to this doorway, like sitting down in this doorway. Mm. The other character is positioned sitting down in this other thing, but their but their body language is very similar, and he can cut to the same shot. He was mirroring them um, very deliberately to yeah. where it wasn't about passage of time; it was about these two struggles kind of happening in concert. Hmm. So I really loved it, and he did it. He does that's it kind of in the second act, and I was like, "Oh, that's really great! I love like it's it's one of those like ideas that a big movie doesn't necessarily always do." And then he does it again in the third act to an even greater extent. I I personally like that a lot, but I think it was I, I, I like. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, just I think it was different than because you're right. Typically, it's you want time to progress so that you feel like it's all happening, right. but it was more I think stylistic than that. And, and again, like, these are such small things because we yeah. all love the film. It's They're, fantastic, yeah, and, and but. But if you remember, like, one of my favorite instances of this of this particular type of editing is the ending of Inception. If you think about where all the different layers and everyone's, like, in sync, like, that to me, I don't know. But there was something about that moment in particular on the dock. It just kind of took me out. I was like, wait a second. Why are they not forwarding their motion before so we come So you're saying in so, his second movie, Krasinski's not quite at Inception level Nolan? God <laughs> damn him. How dare no, he? I, I think, I'll, I'll, last thing I'll add, um, on the second viewing, the one thing that really came out for me that didn't really hit me the first time was the the how important that the the angle the the arc is if you think about the last if you think about Krasinski's death in the first movie and he tells this kid he always loves him right and then what in this yeah one. yeah I thought that was great great I like after like talking to Krasinski about this movie for our podcast um I I really took that family and what our parents give us and what we learn from our parents to heart. Like that mm -hmm. really kind of transitioned into the narrative this time for me than it did the first time. So I liked it better the first, the second time around. Cool, cool, cool. If you have reviews for Quiet Place Part 2, send them to us at realblend <clears throat> at cinemablend.com. Uh, this is a little bit inside baseball, but it's interesting from an industry perspective. CinemaCon... Uh, announced right as we were getting ready to record that they are a go full throttle and all of the major studios are participating. So we wanted to catch you guys up on what CinemaCon is. Um, it is uh, a, a an event that normally takes place in March. They're moving it back to August this year. Uh, it takes place in Las Vegas. Uh, it's a week long and each of the different major studios get half a day to get up on stage and present uh, in Caesars Palace all of the films that they have coming and they'll the roll real out. Caesar's Palace which one who in the who the real the real Caesar's Palace the Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas like like did Caesar stay there like who what Jesus Christ <laughs> um so I just I, I, sorry I, I, I assume gotcha. this was a movie podcast I'm sorry <laughs> no a good movie podcast um, <laughs> no but uh, we, we, we probably should give that context that's that that's that Galif from the hangover. Line, yeah, from the <laughs> thank you yes yeah, I just yeah, went over yeah. completely over my head um <laughs> and the okay. only reason why we're bringing this up is because with each of the major major studios going back uh and this being positioned now as an August thing it feels like there are a lot of really exciting titles for September, October, November, and December that the studios can go out and promote. So the theme of this week's Real Blind episode seems to be the movies are back. Uh, I just want to get a, a sense from you, Jake in particular, um, hearing that all of the studios are ponying up for CinemaCon and getting fully behind it uh, and potentially bringing talent through, does it feel like that is a huge step forward for the industry saying like, no more slowdowns, no more, you know, like with, this is it, we're back full throttle. Yeah, I mean, I, I, mentioned, I think I mentioned last week or the week before that um, one of the cool, weird feelings I did not even think about or expect is this idea of watching a trailer, seeing a date at the end of said trailer, and then going, that's when it comes out. Yeah. And I don't think, and I think last year, every time a new trailer came out with a date on it, we all sort of went, all right, yeah, well, we'll see, we'll see, you know, because it's probably not going to come out around that time. Um, so the idea that uh, studios are basically saying, we're going to come out and show you some of these movies that we have coming out. They, I mean, it costs a lot of money to do that. Like, they wouldn't do that if they didn't think 
that these movies were on the horizon. If they mm-hmm. if they thought like you know they wouldn't do these big splashy presentations that they normally do, if they then had to pull a quiet place and do it all over again 12 months later. So mm-hmm. to me, this is a very inside baseball way of, of telling at least those of us in the media that they're, they're ready to go. They're ready to get back to it. And these, these dates that are, are um, in the trailers and that they're announcing they're they're not written down in, in number two pencil. They're, they're chiseled in stone. And while not, you know, accidental completely, it really did fall to the place where everything that got delayed landed in a nice straight line so that from now into March or April of next year, we have Mm -hmm. big movies, you know, looking to carry the movie going experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think we're going to get a chance to see a lot of those trailers and teasers and a big explanation. So uh, before Quiet Place 2, I saw uh, Jungle Book as a new, uh, no, uh, Jungle Cruise Cruise. as a new trailer out there. Um, I saw Last Night in Soho. Saw something called The (gasps) Night House. Rebecca Hall has a movie called The Night House. She directed that. That's hers, yeah. Did she really? Oh, that's interesting. It looked pretty fascinating. she shot it in... uh... She shot it in, I think, 166 or 133. It's like an interesting aspect ratio, too. Cool. Yeah. So a couple of other yeah. big, And I think I saw an F9 uh, trailer. So, again, feels like... Fine. Yeah. F9? Yeah. looks like everything's coming Fine. back. Uh, theater venue news. Again, things that are interesting to us. And so we're going to assume interesting to you as listeners to Real Blend. Uh, AMC theaters might potentially swoop in and purchase the Arclight and the Pacific Theater's venues. Um, and we were having a conversation before the show started about whether we would prefer uh, the Arclight cinemas to just sort of fade away and, and be the once glorious movie house that they were, uh, or to become part of a bigger chain that might potentially not give as much um, attention to the movie-going experience that the people at the Arclight uh would give uh jake you seem to have some reservations and this isn't a knock at any of the major chains sure um it's just that the arc sort of operated differently uh, yes and the okay let's let, let's there... imagine that, that there were a handful of like really cool awesome indie movie theaters in your neighborhood i'm sorry not indie theaters mexican restaurants in your okay. in your neighborhood and right. they're like kind of kind of cool and hip and like when friends come to town that's where you want to take them and they're like there's just stuff it's there even though you can food. yeah even though you can get tacos a lot of places, there's something about those tacos there that hit you differently. Yeah, sure. And they're going out of business, and you're like, son of a bitch, like we're losing them. And then Taco Bell steps up and says, we're going <laughs> to save you guys, and we're going to turn you into Taco Bells. Well, now Kevin's Isn't happy. there a part of you that's like, look, I'm not knocking Taco Bells. I love a good Taco Bell post <laughs> yeah, sure. 2 o'clock in the morning, but it's not the same as, it's you know, it's so I think that's sort of my fear is these places that were so bummed that we are uh, losing, the reason we're bummed we're losing them is because they're not the thing that we have on every single corner in our neighborhood. They're not mm-hmm. like the surplus neighborhood chain theaters. There's there's an X factor to them. And and again, to your point, we're not knocking these thing these chain theaters, which I really think have stepped up their game a lot within the past couple of years trying to, mm-hmm. you know, but there are just some things that 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 you they're special to them by being just a little bit smaller and a little bit more private. And uh, I feel like if they're a part of a big corporation, they're not going to be able to maintain that. But Kev, if they still at ArcLight maintain 70 millimeter presentations um, mm. of films that you want to see in that theater and, mm. and the venue stays, because I think it's a special venue too. I think it's a special location. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, I think mm-hmm. the design yeah. has some history to it. I would hate to see that that um, architecture gets removed from the LA landscape. Uh, are you okay with with that being the concession? I, what's concession? That's a yeah, good, thank hey. good question. Um, <laughs> I one thing I find interesting about this whole situation is like it, ArcLight. So Arc, so ArcLight is bigger than obviously just the Hollywood, uh, the one that we know in Hollywood, the Cinerama mm-hmm. Dome, right? Yeah. Obviously. So like, like for example, I can drive twenty minutes out of my house right now and go to go to Bethesda, Maryland, and, and go to an ArcLight. Um, I don't know if it's still there now, but or if it's closed down. But um, ArcLight is. It, it, it's interesting. ArcLight's funny to me because when it comes down to it, the majority of their theaters are just general movie theaters, and it's that one that's super special. I think the, from what I can yeah. tell, I've never been yeah. to other ArcLights. So, of course, I don't want I don't want it to go to a, a gigantic chain and then lose its special nature. Because to me, the, my favorite thing about ArcLight, and they still do this at other locations as well, is an usher comes in. And tells you the movie you're gonna watch. He like talks to the audience, tells you where you are, how long the runtime is. But like, there are special things that are done at the Hollywood arc light that I don't think would still happen under a gigantic chain like AMC. And we love AMC, but 
ArcLight Hollywood, it, it, to me, they're, they're two separate things. ArcLight Hollywood and then ArcLight in general. Um, so if you're AMC and this happens, I would argue that if you're AMC, you keep ArcLight Hollywood the way it is. Mm-hmm. So don't yeah. change anything. Same management. It's just owned mm-hmm. by AMC. Mm-hmm. Just in the an same overhead. way, like, didn't uh, Disney allow Fox Searchlight to just remain Fox Searchlight? Yeah. Right. Right. Like, so like, like for yeah, right. So like Disney, like if you if you guys ever watch um when you watch a Star Wars movie open up, right? It doesn't say Disney. It just yeah, says yeah, yeah, Lucasfilm. Yeah. Lucasfilm. Yeah. Right? It never says Disney. You don't get the Disney logo, you don't get the animation nothing. It's just they just happen to own Star Wars. So it's all under yeah. the You just the get the umbrella. poor planning. Yeah, I don't think it was a Disney. <laughs> I don't think it was a Disney logo before any Marvel film no, either. Just Marvel. I don't think so. Yeah. Right. No. So if you think about it, Disney bought those two aspects of of cinema and still didn't put their name on them in terms of right. the audience seeing them up front sure. so in, in an ideal situation if amc buying arc light could help save it overall or or fix that issue overall and then they can keep hollywood the same i'm cool with that i mean i i, I have a hard time believing that enough filmmakers won't step up to say can we at least keep this one right the way it is. And, but Arclight is a special thing, man. I, I mean, like I said, even I, when I go to Bethesda, uh, to, to sit there and have an usher come in, a human being, and sit in front of the audience and say, hey, you are here for the 310 showing of the Phantom Thread. And, you know, I, it, it's a personal experience that I personally love. Mm. Um, so I just, I hope that doesn't go away. You know, I particularly, and I think we all kind of approached it cynically when we first heard it of like oh no they're just gonna turn they're just buying the real estate you know like they just want to have yeah. an amc theater at this location but what if thinking completely on the opposite end of that what if amc's like no we want the arclight brand and we want to launch nationwide mm-hmm. amc arclight experience theaters the way that they have yeah the, like the okay. artisan the deluxe the way do. that Remember they have that? their deluxe yeah. theaters and stuff like that in an imax theater they're like oh go here for your artisan films go here for oh, an introduction yeah. and like Maybe, maybe they'll think, maybe, maybe that's a way for them to, to do something cool. I doubt it, but you know, in, in the interest of being like, positive, maybe. The one in Hollywood though, I just think you don't change. That's the only one I think you leave alone. I mean, I, and I'm not saying that other art like aren't special, but like to Gabe's point, you, AMC buys it. It's still called Arclight, which would be great. Maybe Arclight by AMC or Arclight, you know, whatever it would be. Um, and you still keep the presence of it. Like, like, okay, one of my favorite experiences I've ever had in a movie theater, and I'll keep this brief, was going to see Paul Thomas Anderson's Phantom Thread. Before that movie showed, there was a 20-minute soundtrack, as you know, yeah. Sean, mm-hmm. that, that he curated. Is that going to happen under AMC? I don't know. No, you're going to get it's... movie trivia, and you're going to get a thing where you get your cell phone <laughs> right. and, like, play the space game. <laughs> and that's kind of what I'm hoping. Like that. So I, I feel like... I don't think AMC is stupid. I think AMC is, and this is something coming from somebody uh, who has been going to AMC all my life, as you guys have. You know, there's positives and negatives to uh, all types of theaters. AMC has been stepping up their game, though. Their IMAXs and their Dolby's are pretty awesome. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to lie. Their, 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 their Dolby theaters are insane. Um, and so for me, like, you just, you just, you got to keep that personable experience. I'm also thinking that AMC is going to have to jump into the personable game even more just in general in their theaters. Because you want to make these experiences special somehow. Probably. That's all. I mean, that, and that's kind of what I'm looking for. Well, so, And to that end, uh, the next bit of news is that Alamo Draft House, which is another chain that sort of goes out of its way to make the experience a little more special in terms of their dining options and sometimes their alternate programming, is opening five new locations uh, through 2022. Benefit to Gabe, one of them is going to be in St. Louis. Benefit to Kevin, there's going to be yet another one in Washington, D.C. Uh, Jake and I lose out significantly because we're getting no Alamo draft houses anywhere near us. Um, and not only that, I want to throw this in too. This was the week that I found out that the um, Regal Phillips Place movie theater, which is the one that is five minutes from my house, which hosted uh, all of our press screenings for the 20 something years that I've been in this market, uh, is going to be closing and being turned mm. into a parking deck. So, oh. yay, Charlotte. Way to go oh. for your arts community. 
Sean is a. Uh, See, those are the stories that. Oh, Sean is still on the weekends, them. gonna drive and like park halfway in and watch a movie on his phone <laughs> and just watch on his phone. <laughs> I can't tell you. You how- can't take this away from me. <laughs> I cannot tell you how many memories I have in that movie theater. Uh, that's I awful, mean, man. I saw mm. so many amazing films at well, that there, theater. A lot of cars now they're gonna have memories. A in that parking spot. deck. Yeah. Can you believe that? A parking. Do you, deck. you know, like Chicago was supposed to be the home. It's the same, but not the same. Chicago was gonna be the home of the George Lucas Lucasfilm Museum. That's right. And it was going to house all of the Star Wars memorabilia and right. Indiana Jones memorabilia. And it was going to be why Jake beautiful moved along the lake. But then it went to San Francisco, and, right? Um, it went to San Francisco because uh, Chicago decided, no, it's a parking lot. And we don't know if we want to lose that. Instead, hey, Jake, so we, would, you, would, would you say Chicago kind of threw the saber over their shoulder kind of thing? It's a stretch, and I don't even like it to begin with. So let's uh, let's keep it moving, guys. Let's go to this. I would say it's about as, as, as promising of a decision as the opening of Temple of Doom. Let's go to uh, <laughs> this week in movies. Hey, Jake, anything goes. Uh, Sam- <laughs> Samaritan is opening. Um, I don't think we know what it's that is. Samaritan. Samaritan. Yes. Like like s'more, but Samaritan. Yes. Like like the it's good person, like the right? good Samaritan. Oh, okay. like the good Samaritan. Um, I don't think I've ever heard the word like Samaritan without like an adjective, the adjective in front of like it. The like good a good Samaritan. Samaritan. That's a good, good point. Samaritan. Yeah. We, we don't know if this one's it's a good a weird, or not. It's a weird word to hear it's Just Samaritan. Solo. They, yes. they were like, originally like, going to call it like the curious. morally ambiguous Samaritan, but it was too long. <laughs> is a Samaritan <laughs> someone from Samaria? I'm assuming that the location is Samaria and the, the it's a resident of, Samar- of Samaria. This is a biblical... Hearing that word alone reminds me of like hearing like a famous person's name with just their first name. Yeah. Like, Julia. you don't call it Tom Cruise. Yeah. He's yeah. not Tom. Yeah. <laughs> What's like, weird is when, like, so we, like, we know, like, Robert De Niro's publicist. It's weird, like, whenever you talk to him and he refers to him as Bob, Bob or Bob. Bob. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like I'm that. Like, I, can't, I can't do that. There's I, can't an, do I will, dude, Anthony, Anthony Hopkins. Hopkins. Anthony Hopkins. Call me Tony. No. Tony. No, I call <laughs> me Tony. I will no, not call I'm you Tony. calling you Tony. Not yeah, calling yeah, you Tony. Sir Tony, maybe? Yeah. I don't know. Also, like, Robert Downey Jr. has to be, you have to use all three. Like, I don't think anyone's just like Rob. Robert, yeah. Or, Rob, yeah, or even Robert Downey. Like, even that, to me, that's, that's weird, too. Maybe yeah. RDJ? Yeah. RDJ. RDJ. Maybe. Oh, yeah. RDJ. Yeah, maybe. Um, is Samaritan, is someone from a Samaritan from from Samaria? I will read you the synopsis <laughs> via, I'm on Wikipedia randomly. Yes. Uh, Samaritan is an upcoming American superhero thriller film directed by Julius Avery and starring Sylvester Stallone. What? What? <laughs> the project has been described as a dark new take on superhero movies. Shit. I want to watch that. Yeah. How do I watch this? Uh, Coming to your local theater. Asked, asked the host of a movie podcast. Why, movies are back. <laughs> uh, the animated film Spirit Untamed has an excellent cast, including Jake Gyllenhaal and Tony Collette, I believe. No, no, no. Tony Collette does the other one. Different horse Dream movie. Horse. <laughs> yes. Jesus Christ, Sean. Oh, wait, so the who's, host of a movie podcast. who's the actress in Spirit Untamed? Julianne Moore. Oh, that's right. It is Julianne Moore. Oh, by Jesus. the way, uh, in a recent episode, I mentioned the fact that, oh, when we were playing Emma Stone Blend and people brought up Crazy Stupid Love. And I was like, oh, that's always on Netflix. And I never pressed play on it. Well, this past weekend, I pressed play on it. And, um, Did you love it? Oh, it's delightful. Yeah. No, yeah. I'd seen it already. But yeah. I saw it but like... But that, that moment when it all comes together and they all like realize how they all actually know each other is yes. perfect. Yeah. That twist perfect. was awesome. Oh, it was that great. Got, that yeah. totally got me the yeah. first time I saw yeah. it. I was like, whoa. But I forgot how often Gosling and Emma Stone work together. You know, like... Yeah. They have their relationship in that. They're in Gangster Squad, obviously yeah. La La Land. And I was like, eh, these guys just have amazing chemistry. So yeah. uh, none of us has seen Spirit Untamed. <laughs> uh, but we did see The Conjuring, The Devil Made Me Do It. Uh, the third chapter in the ongoing Conjuring series. The first one not to be directed by James Wan, taken over by Michael Chavez, who prior to this did The Curse of La Llorena uh, for the, which I think is in the Conjuring universe. I'm going to mm-hmm. go out on a limb and say that was not correct. But. That's no, not that is that absolutely correct. how you say it. The Curse of La Llorena. I don't think it had two Llorona. A's. I think it had no. Llorona. La Llorona. La Llorona? La Llorona? That's yeah. my Jesus Sharona. Christ. You're talking about my Sharona. Now we're a fan. That's, that, that, honestly, that, that's how Jesus. they, that, I remember yeah, that's, yeah, that that's what they had the junket. That's they what said, they that's said. That's how you say it. Yeah, they were like, if you want to say it right, think of my Sharona. My Sharona. That's, a, that's what they said. It didn't make the movie any better. Um, and unfortunately, I don't think it makes The Conjuring 3 any better. Um, I was mildly disappointed in this film. Um, but what I'll say is that 
I still love the idea of the of the Warrens. I like Ed and Lorraine Warren. I like the idea of exploring some of their cases. I think Patrick Wilson and Vera Farmiga are fantastic in the roles. Um, I think that you could, it doesn't matter who's directing, as long as they're part of it, they're going to make it interesting. They're dialed into those characters. Um, this, and I loved, I actually loved the concept or the premise that was driving this story home, mm-hmm. which is mm-hmm. um, a, a, a man commits a murder uh, in a sort of blackout state um and they the court decision or the the way that they decide that they're going to argue his innocence is through demonic possession was and it a true story it's a true story and he, and actually that's why I, I i actually hated the title but i didn't realize this till i started doing research that's what people referred to that to that case as okay. they call they called it the the devil made me do it trial and it was the first time someone was trying to mm-hmm. argue the first time in american history in american history okay so um and and the the line that's fantastic, which is used in the trailer, is that the court accepts the 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 presence of God every single time a witness swears in, because you put your hand on a Bible and say, "I swear to tell the truth." So help me God. So why would you not accept the opposite end of that, which is the existence of Satan and the devil? Um, but it it and so all of that's great. <laughs> that being said, I felt like it didn't do what I was hoping it was going to do with that premise, which would be really explain the legal process and how they figured that out. And instead it just sends the Warrens down a path to gather all this proof about whether there was a, um, it it ended up becoming like a spell that was cast on the family. And, um, it was a lot of evidence. Jake and I were texting each other at the end of the movie and we were like, all the evidence that they were trying to get wouldn't help the court case, like in the least bit. So yeah. why were they it, doing like, They would this? be on the stand and be like, we saw some crazy shit and we have none of it. To, we have none of it here with us, right. but we saw it. Yeah. So, um, and even that, even the exploration, uh, it takes them to, they, they find an old, uh, priest who had one time been involved in exorcisms and, and none of it was like, it just wasn't interesting. I, I yeah. don't, it's hard to explain, but I just found yeah. it to be kind of boring. And I think you're and kind of, of all, the same it's not scary. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's just not scary. And I consider the first two conjuring films to be significantly scary. Yes. I, I, I am with you in that. The thing that I'm most disappointed in is that I really want to see someone make a really great movie about the devil made me do it trial. Mm. Like I'm now weirdly fascinated in that. And I feel like this is going to scare people off from doing it for a while because people are going to go, oh, well, The Conjuring did that, so we can't really like. So like, there's a great movie to be had there. And I remember being disappointed when we we see the beginning of the trial and then they go off on this adventure and then we only come back to the trial at the very end of the film. And yeah. I kept thinking like, that's that's the part of this movie I like, the actual true story I want to see. Like, how how did they argue it? But that's a different film. Yeah, uh, I was. You know, it's not a bad film by no. any measure. No. Um, it's it's not scary, um, and I remember. Yeah, it's, it's it's the first one of the Conjuring films where I walked out genuinely disappointed. Um, that being said, they do have great chemistry together, Vera and Patrick. Also, the I, the Conjuring oh. films to this point have always introduced another element, like Annabelle mm-hmm. gets introduced and the they get to spin off. The nun gets introduced. The Slender Man. Um, the element that gets Is introduced Slender in Man this Conjuring. One, I think so. I thought it was from Conjuring Two. Was it not? I thought Slender Man's like an online thing. I don't know. Is it? I don't know. Hmm. I make shit up all the time on the show. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Kev, what were you going to say? I'm sorry. You had something to add? I, I, was, I was just going to say, I, re, I revisited the first Conjuring this weekend. And I, I all I remember, do you remember, remember the, you guys remember the story surrounding this? That movie was rated R because it was scary. Because it was scary. Like, that, that was that was the reason it got an R rating was because awesome. like the MPA I think it literally says in the description it's rated R because of like terror terrifying or yeah. terror or whatever yeah like there's no um, blood no gore no sex no violence no language it was just it's really just scary scary <laughs> and that, which is kind of crazy to think about yeah. it's one of the best marketing tools I've oh, ever heard yeah. in my I life. brought it up like, in the ju- I remember I brought it up yeah. in the junket and so I was watching the first one and I haven't seen the new one yet so I'm actually curious to ask this the first and the second one the way James Wan creates atmosphere mm. is so interesting to me like when i watch the conjuring this past weekend it feels like a dirty cold just horrifying experience and i mean that in the best way possible from an immersive uh, space because every frame of that movie feels dangerous mm-hmm. and i don't know if it's i don't know what they what juan does to to give us that i guess i would liken it to if in terms of building an atmosphere on a completely different scale do you guys remember like when you saw do the right thing the first time and you could feel the heat mm-hmm. 
of Brooklyn, like through your screen, you mm-hmm. could tell how hot everything was. Same thing, kind of in be the a heights. Good summer movie pick. Yeah, in the heights is another great example about that too, like where you can feel the heat. And so, going on the opposite end of genre, Juan kind of gives you this disturbing mm-hmm. coldness yeah. as you watch The Conjuring. Um, and so, every frame of that movie is is, is disturbing to me. Like it, it made my it makes my stomach crawl. Like yeah. even if something crazy is not happening, yeah. do you get that at all in get, three? Get, no, no, no. It's too. It's oh. way too polished. Yeah, it's way too polished. Like like <sighs> I feel like Conjuring is particularly the first one feels like it was made in the seventies. Can I share yeah. a cool story? Yeah, I went please, to yeah. the I went to the set of The Conjuring. They, the, the first, first one? one, the first one. They filmed. You, they, I never knew that. They filmed Did it. Did you get in, to see like some of the cool shots there, like the cool uh, tracking shots he was doing and stuff? Oh my I'm god! I'm going to tell you the shot that we watched them film. Uh, okay. They filmed it in Wilmington, and we got to see two different setups. One was Vera Farmiga um, in a in the basement crawl space uh, mm-hmm. as she was trying to light up um, a match to see what was going on around her. Yeah, and the scene. second yeah. setup that we watched was Lily, um, L- Lily, uh, what's her name? The actress. Who's I, know at, you're t- uh, I know you're talking Who's about. at the top oh, of the, yeah. the, d- the dark stairs. The mom, yeah. Lighting, lighting the match um, where the face or hands, um, what comes out of the dark behind her? Oh, the. Yes, 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 yeah. yes. We watched yeah. him film that. We watched. Wait, you wait. Did you see like an actor like did behind her? Like, going, out? yes. We watched. That's scary. We watched wow, even just thinking that. about that scene. Oh, oh that's my very god. Practical. That, oh, that guy, that little girl. That, is that? Well, I don't, is it the little girl who's in that scene that's banging her head yeah. against the door? Isn't she the daughter from Interstellar? Isn't that um, the same actor? Oh, I don't know. Is Maybe. It? Yeah, it's been Either a while. way, she's banging her head against that door, and all I remember that 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 entire scene is horrifying. Like yeah. you, so you saw the hands come That's out. So, so cool. Cool. okay, yeah. so but okay, we we hear the Conjuring now, and we're like, oh my god, this huge, massive series, and it's very popular. But like, what was the attitude toward it, like at that time? Because oh, it was like before any of us really knew they what Conjuring were was. not. They had no idea of it being yeah. a franchise. I think the only thing that they did talk about was that Ed and Lorraine had so many cases. That they would be interested in exploring if the audience showed an interest in in yeah. pursuing them, and they talked heavily about um, Amityville because they said, you know, yeah. that's their yeah. most famous case, sure, and that ends up becoming the beginning I'm... of Conjuring Two. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I would like I would have loved to see them do the Amityville as a full on movie. Um, yeah, because I just think in in James Wan's hands it would have been fascinating. So um, yeah, but uh, but no, I don't think they had any idea that what they were doing was going to be that special. They told did you. Great- did you do? I know Kevin did. Sean, did you do the Conjuring for the uh, Conjuring Junket, the first one? Because uh, we did the did. Um, we got to interview Lorraine Warren. She was paired with James. Oh, Wan. then I did not. No. Um, no, 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 Ed had already passed away. Ed passed away, I believe, in two thousand six. But yeah, if you, if she did the Junket for the first Conjuring, which was a trip. That's pretty cool. Um, I would give this two and a half, two and a half out of five. Yeah, that's that's yeah. about spot on. I think that's spot on. Okay. All right. The devil made me do it. Um it's in Sean, theaters. what's your rating for Quiet Place Part Two? Four and a half. Four and a half out of four. five. Okay. Yeah, four and a half. I'd cool. I'd probably do four. Four? Yeah, okay. I went yeah. four. Yeah. No, I just think it's so airtight. Where um, are you, Gabe? Here's the thing, I hate star ratings. Um <laughs> because Then why do you make us do it? Because people like it. Because <laughs> it's the way the industry goes. I can't fight it. Some bullshit, um, man. To me, to me, I want to give it a five, and I want to say, if you enjoy this kind of movie, if you enjoy exciting, interesting, fun mm-hmm. thrillers, mm-hmm. it does that perfectly. There's no reason for you not to like it. But because we're giving it this quantified star rating, and I know I have a couple nitpicks, mm-hmm. it's a four and a half. But like, mm-hmm. I would recommend it to someone as often I would recommend a five. So mm-hmm. say, do with yep. that what you will. All right. And since we're heading into the summer movie season... This week's blend game is hashtag summer movie blend. And the way that we're trying to um, single this out is that the movie had to, I think, I think this is what we're saying. It had to take place in the summertime. The story had to take place in the summertime uh, or it just is a summer movie. Like star Wars is a summer movie. Yes. Right? It's, it's so it was, so it was more personal. It was See, it's a feeling. For you, what is your favorite movie? That's yeah. like, ah, it's the summertime reminds me of summer evokes summer for you. So like, yeah. for okay. instance, some people wrote in with, the Dark Knight, and it's like that's okay. not a summer movie. It's not even hot, I think, during that movie. Um, but it's like a summer release. They remember that summer. It evokes summertime. For them. Okay. Um, I I can't not pick Jaws. I can't. Uh, does everybody pick Jaws? Did you pick you pick Jaws as well too? Um, then then Jake, you take Jaws, and I'll take something different. So go ahead, go. Oh, I don't want to steal Jaws from you. No, that's okay. I had another one, and I yeah. see someone else actually picked it, so I'm going to go with them. I uh, think I know Kevin's too. Okay. 
I think I, I want to predict Kevin's before he says it. I don't know. That to me, that is the movie that I make a point to watch during the summer. Like when when, when it starts heating up outside. And the thing is, too, I have to watch it during the day. Uh, I want it to be sunny. I want to. I want it to be really hot outside. And I just sit down and just it's just masterful. It is a perfect film. You know, if there is a small folder I have in which I would put films in that are that are frame by frame, absolutely perfect. And I just so everything about that movie it takes place over the long Fourth of July weekend. Everyone's really hot. They're out on the beach. You know, everything. The movie you you feel hot while you're watching it. Everything about that movie evokes the the feeling of summer. The and then summer it, crowd. Propels yeah, the summer the story crowd. Forward. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and then also, and, and the and the mayor's the villain. You yeah, know, it's, it's so I'm great. I'm gonna yeah, punch yeah. you in the face. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, and also like you know, the, the, also the fact on the flip side, the, the film aspect of it, the fact that it invented the summer movie season. Yes, like it, you know, it is it is the first summer blockbuster. Um, so everything about that movie says summer. Like whenever, whenever you know, I, I was telling you guys, there are a handful of movies that it has to be just the right circumstances for me to like, and I will wait for those circumstances. And the two big ones I use are for the thing, it has to be a blizzard outside, and for uh, Jaws, it has to be a summer day. It has to be blistering hot, and I have to be inside. And it has to be in the daylight coming into my apartment, and and uh, and I love it. And I, I haven't done it yet this summer, um, but there's another movie I do that for as well, and it's not my pick, but I think it's Kevin's pick. Okay. Am I? Am I? Del- wait, wait, write it down. All right, write it down, and then let's see if you got it right. Well, you wait, two do John, that. You take yours. Well, I'll give my uh, pick. Um, actually, I read it wrong. This this someone named Levi Sager went with Summer Rental, which is a John Candy film, but I'm going with Summer School, uh, which is a Mark <laughs> Harmon film. Uh, one of those films that, as a kid, I adored uh, for many different reasons. A, uh, well, it cracks me up now because Michelle's a teacher. And I, I can't tell you how accurate it is on that last day of school when all the teachers are running to their cars and the principal has to get some of the teachers to stay uh, for summer school to be able to run them. And, and like the phys ed teacher, Mark Harmon, actually f- hides in the bushes so the principal cannot find him. Uh, and his name is Shoop. That's his nickname. And they make him teach like summer school. Oh, I've seen that movie. I like that movie. Terrific movie. And so, I like that movie. I've seen that. But this is why I love it. This um, I, I think I told you guys at one point my eighth grade project that I did was on movie um, horror makeup, right? That I, I, I did the whole process about how you do movie makeup and I learned how they do caro syrup in order to create and they use red dye, you know, all the old practical effects that like, you know, Rick Baker light essentially that, that people get to do. And there were two characters in summer school who were like my idols as a kid growing up, uh, Chainsaw and Dave. And they were guys who just worked at a video store and adored movie references. And there's a great scene where they are trying to gross out the principal. And so they horror movie make up all the uh, people in the class. And like one girl has her eyeball hanging out. It's on the desk. And, and then Chainsaw and Dave come running in with chainsaws to try and scare the principal. And it doesn't go over well and everything but i loved it i thought that was the greatest uh scene and so uh a school setting uh at summertime i figured that was a great pick for summer movie blend and uh we don't talk about summer school oh i love that movie that's a great if you've never seen it it's really fun i think i know kevin's too um i but you guys go ahead and play it and i'll tell you if i was right no, it's that's actually oh. not right, Jay. Oh, oh wait. I, I, okay, hold on. Let me write mine. I, 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 th- I thought it was Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Hold on. I well, will Sean, you can say, just say... You don't have to write it down. Well, well, no, no, I, I'm, I'm actually curious. Well, now yeah, we have to do the, the dramatic, like, it. slide it across the table. <laughs> yeah. It's, 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 it's for the effect. Guys. All right, hold on. My guess is do the right thing. No. Oh, really? Oh, I'm, I'm, this actually makes me excited that you guys don't know it yet. Okay. All right. Now... So Jake brings up a, a good one because that's now my favorite Tarantino movie after like 20 watches. And it, and it is like the the summer vibe of that movie is amazing. Sure. Um, Jaws is something I would have I would have talked about or, or questioned in my mind. I don't know about you guys. I, one of the greatest movies of all time. 10 out of 10. That movie gets more and more brutal every time I watch it. Oh, yeah. Know, when uh, the yeah. old... When the Quint dies, guess, that Quint death the, scene it, is people do not give it credit for how brutal it is. I don't understand how. I mean, I, I do understand why it got PG, but <laughs> how it got not didn't get an R. I you know, know, you know what, what then, death is brutal in Jaws to Chrissy. me. I was going to say kid, the, 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 girl the Kittner in the boy. Beginning? Yeah, I was just I was going to say the Kittner kid. That shot where you see the shark rolling over and you see the kid flailing for a hot second, and, and the, the blood, blood splurts shoots. out. It's a quick shot, but mm-hmm. that's the one that gets me. And that's the famous uh, dolly zoom when they go into Roy Scheider's yeah, yeah, yeah. face. No, uh, I thought Chrissy's in the too. beginning. The way Chrissy's she's screaming too. is brutal. Yeah. That's I, 
I don't know. That movie's hard to watch now for me. It's just it, it's got, like Quint's death is so because it painful. So what's oh. your pick? All right, all right. My pick is, in Jaws my two. opinion, the ultimate summer movie. It's it's the film that makes me feel like oh, summer. Sandlot. You're picking Sandlot. The Sandlot. Yeah, you're picking Sandlot. Okay. That was the yeah. uh, the Rublin tweet today. What was it? Oh, yeah. that's right. Gabe did choose Sandlot. Oh, yeah. Yes, for the Sandlot. The GIF. That is also simultaneously my favorite comfort movie of all time. <laughs> um, it's comforting that's a great and pick. summer. It's a great pick. It's, I just, I just, everything about that movie makes me happy. Mm. Every single thing about it. Um, from Smalls's oversized fisherman hat to uh, the the PF flyers to Forever to S'mores to, I mean, you don't get more summer than there's two scenes: the kids in the treehouse telling the forever story with the with the with the flashlight and the flashback back and then like trying to scare the kids i mean that that is exactly what my friends and i used to do when we were kids we would like have forts or build forts or whatever and you, and that movie just reminds me of that time period of my life it just speaks to summer and then the second scene which is probably the best scene in the movie is when um is when squints tries to get uh wendy peppercorn to kiss him by drowning anything in and a community <laughs> pool is summer that scene yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. When, when like when and when the kid jumps off and says cannonball and jumps in but that moment when when he looks at the guys and kind of and like he's about to do something funny and then he fake drowns and then she pulls him out and the fact that they end up getting married and having kids at the end is even better um which is awesome but yeah the sandlot it just, if anything, if a movie will put a smile on my face, it would be The Sandlot. Okay. It would, that would be the ultimate summer comfort film. And I think that movie will forever be solidified as that movie for me. It's more, it, technically it's a July 4th movie, if you want to call it that, because it has, it, it takes place during July 4th. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. it, but that's the summer, just like obviously. Yeah. yeah, so it, it's, uh, it, it, it's a movie that stands the test of time. Uh, it's a brilliant ensemble piece. Those kids are so great together. Um, I wish I could have been doing press at that time. That movie meant so much to me as a kid. So that's my that's my pick. Just, oh. Everything about that movie Ooh, speaks summer. Neat. And it also doesn't have a shark biting someone in half. I have so. summer school. <laughs> I'm going to watch oh, it tonight. I'm watching that tonight. <clears throat> I'm so happy. Oh, Christy Alley is in this. Do you know that? Now I, summer school. Now I know that. I'm going to watch that. Uh, okay. When so, was the last time you guys all watched The Sandlot? Recently. Not that long ago. I watched yeah. it with the boys recently. Yeah. And it helped what do out. your kids think about it? They liked it. Yeah. Remember, they don't like films. <laughs> they generally don't like movies. It's really hard to get them to yeah. watch a movie. So. All right. PJ came to uh, Quiet Place 2. I was thrilled. That's awesome. Brendan wants to watch Insidious. He was like, what's that oh movie? Oh, my God. I know. Well, only because yes. I have told them that that's the movie that I had to walk out of the theater for yeah. because I couldn't Insidious 2 is also scary. handle it. Um, the first Insidious is the first Insidious the scariest PG thirteen movie. I think so. I, I, ever I, made. I mean, I th- that it just unnerved me. It unnerved it's me. It's so disturbing. It's really yeah. scary. Yeah, really scary. Okay, audience picks. Uh, Paul Marsh went with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. Harry Lichtman said Jurassic Park. Jake, where were you on that one? Levi Sager said Summer Rental. Uh, Dana Rogers, Michael Kamen's, and many others went with Independence Day. That's a really good pick for a, yeah. a mm-hmm. summer movie, summer blockbuster. Uh, yeah. TD, Nick Frazier, and many others went with Do the Right Thing. At Rob the Mind said The Dark Knight. Michelle Garris, Jeff Maiman, De- David Cuozo, uh, and others went with Jaws. And Randy Buss went with Eight Men Out, which is a, a baseball film, which I guess any yeah. baseball film is, would sort of be a summer movie as well, too. Sure. And a shout out to David Cuozo, who works at Netflix. And he's, uh, he's a big film guy, loves uh, film, and just happens to work in the industry. And uh, he's the one who got us uh, Army of the Dead, the press junket for that movie. Awesome. So shout out to David Thank for you, being David. a... Uh, Good. He's awesome at Netflix. Good He's guy. a good dude. Very cool. Yeah. All right. For next week, reach out on Twitter. We're going to be doing the films of Elliot Page. Hashtag Elliot Page blend. Do we take Inception off the table? Inception's got to stay no. on the table, I guess, right? Inception's definitely one of no, Elliot's it has to be considered. Okay. biggest movies. All right. Yeah. I just yeah. wanted to make sure we're not all picking it right away. I guess I, I kind of know mine. And I think I'm going in a different direction. So, okay. So you can play along with Elliot Page Blend by using hashtag Elliot Page Blend. That is two L's, one T for people who are playing along at home. Uh, or let us know your pick 
at realblend at cinemablend.com. That is also where you can send us reviews. We do not have one this week, so make sure you head to Apple Podcasts and send us a review. Post it up there. Uh, share the show with friends. That's the best way to get Real Blend out there. Our next premium episode is going to be the two-film challenge game, which is always a lot of fun. We're going to be doing it for composers. Um, and if you want to get access to this and all the episodes of Real Blend, go to cinemablend.com backslash real blend premium we'll be back next week with a brand new free episode waiting for you guys uh in the meantime follow us on social media at jake's takes at kevin mccarthy tv at sean underscore o'connell at gabe kovach and the show is at real blend potentially next week we'll have a few more details that we might be able to share about something cool that's coming up i don't know are we gonna are we gonna say that out loud? i still don't think we should mention it until it happens oh you well, think we'll, so we will mention it when we have a photo to share oh wow. yeah because that's until hard. then even then yeah. we might get a photo and they're like that's it's, all the time we have <laughs> yeah. if it happens hey but that still, would be a story yeah this, right. this is a major if it happens and, yeah. and, and for people who are tuning in for, to our show for the first time we all have this superstitious bit mm -hmm. where no like, you had a it. superstitious bit and now it's gotten in our heads Although and now we can't now, now we I, won't let it go I feel true. obligated and again this is another instance where the real ones are the only ones here the, the fake ones Everyone are all tuned out punches out yeah, yeah. Um, so if you're here Welcome to the real ones, gang. Yeah. Um, I feel like <laughs> we've we've set up, and Jake this week definitely kind of leaned into it. I mm -hmm. don't think on purpose that it might be Spielberg. It's not Spielberg. I will say it's not Spielberg. Not Spielberg. <laughs> it's right. not yeah. Spielberg. And everyone everyone's guessing Spielberg. When it's, not not yet. Spielberg. Not when yet. it's Spielberg, we won't even yeah. mention his name out of fear that it'll fall through. That's just We're not even weird. gonna tell you that there's an if it happens no. to begin You'll with. Wake yeah. up even one if we morning. get Spielberg, we might not even put it on the show. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but to That's ensure true. that we got Spielberg, everyone has a title they're gonna yell. Are you ready? Yes. Three, Always. two, one. War horse! Always! Uh uh, Last Crusade. <laughs> I was trying to think of something to say. I don't know. It's got 90 credits. I know. I, the 90 I, I biggest movies of all mind. time. 